um, a total free for all because it can get a little messy on Zoom. So I'm going to share my screen. I just have a couple of slides to sort of guide the discussion. I guess the first thing that I think about is who chooses the field of neurosurgery? You know, a number of you on this have already decided that this is the field for you. Some of you may be still trying to figure it out. And my impression is that the, the one thing that of all of the neurosurgeons that I've met, uh, including myself, the thing, the thing that unite us are that we're all passionate about neurosciences and caring for patients. Obviously, that's anyone who goes into medicine, but neurosciences stands out. We are passionate about a procedural field where we get to use our hands. And most of us, the vast majority of us, I think, also enjoy the fast-paced and immersive lifestyle of neurosurgery. You know, this is not a subspecialty. This is not a specialty or subspecialty where, um, you know, the, the day starts at nine and ends at five. It is, we're constantly involved with our patients. Um, and most of us at least get some form of thrill from that, um, in addition to all of the other things that we enjoy about the field. And when, once you decide that this is the field for you, you, you kind of have to pick a training program. And there are a lot of opportunities to choose from around the country or around the world. Um, and to me, the best advice that I can provide sort of in this brief framework is that you need to think about a few things. And obviously, one of them is how good is the training environment? Does it provide the um, experience and opportunity that you need, meaning surgical volume? surgical experience among the faculty, diversity of experience among the faculty, um, as well as the full range of representation of the different subspecialties in neurosurgery and a, and a diverse patient population. All of those give you a great training experience overall. But then there's the personal fit component, which is a little bit more subtle and um, a little harder to pinpoint. And some of that involves getting to know the residents who you'd be working with because they're your closest colleagues in your program. But also just getting a feel for who are these faculty members who are going to be teaching me? Um, how well will I, will I learn from them? Are there styles, potentially the kind of styles that I will jive with and, uh, and learn the most from? And this is going to be, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week also in the um, tips for a virtual interview season session. Um, but I just want to put that on your radar as I, I think personal fit is a huge part of choosing a training program. And then the question of whether you do fellowships, which, you know, brings us to choosing a sub subspecialty. So once you've chosen neurosurgery, what are you going to do? Are you going to be a general neurosurgeon? Are you going to be a tumor neurosurgeon? Are you going to do pediatrics, functional neurosurgery, spine surgery? You know, there are a lot of choices here. And I think the thing that I'm trying to emphasize in my talk is that the opportunities are virtually limitless here. Most people go into medicine thinking they're going to be a, a doctor at the bedside taking care of patients. But just as when you go into medicine, you could just as easily find yourself as a consultant or some other healthcare company. In neurosurgery, you could find yourself in a whole range of different um, careers, depending on what your interests are. And for me, what stood out in choosing a specialty, probably more than anything else, was finding who I consider to be my people. So the people at the conferences, in the departments that I've worked in, who were not most like me, but with whom I fit in best, were the people in pediatric neurosurgery. And that was most of what drew me to the field initially. And of course, you know, I chose a field where I valued caring for children and caring for their families. Um, but I have to say that the people I work with in my subspecialty are, obviously no offense to Dr. Germano, are among my favorite people in, uh, in neurosurgery. Um, what do you value? What are your interests in the field? Do you um, enjoy the minutia of the functional neuroanatomy of the brain such that you want to probe the inner reaches of the brain with DBS electrodes and, and other forms of neuromodulation? Um, do you want to take out tumors all day? Do you want to deal with back pain? Um, what are, the, what are the personal sides of medicine and neurosurgery that get you most excited? Because each of our subspecialties handles those very differently and handles very different patient populations. 
you know, some some sort of more generic headings here, or do you like long-term follow-up or brief encounters? Are you going to be a trauma neurosurgeon who sees patients for a relatively short acute period? Um, are you going to be a tumor neurosurgeon who follows them potentially for months, years, decades, um, as they're as a, a watching for a recurrence, managing recurrences? Do you like high acuity, high stress, or not? You know, do you want to clip ruptured aneurysms? Um, do you want to intervene for stroke as rapidly as you possibly can? Or do you want to have the time to think about how to improve someone's tremor or manage their epilepsy? And then the biggest, easiest headings I think to figure out are, do you like to take care of kids, middle-aged adults or older adults? And do you like to care for the brain or the spine? To me, those are the simplest ones to answer, but are obviously will we'll help shuttle you in the right direction. Um, in addition to finding your people, watch your people. When you are a resident, um, you know, you're immersed in the work, but also make yourself a fly on the wall. You know, see what your faculty are doing during the day, what your, co more, your more senior residents are doing during the day. Hear about what they do in their lives. And that's part of why we're having this session is to tell you a little bit more about sort of what our, what our daily life is like. I'll get to that last in my slides. <laughs> And then lastly, what surgeries are fun for you? You know, if you if you hate doing microdiscectomies, and you, you won't figure this out as a medical student because you won't get enough hands-on, but as a resident, if you find that you hate microdiscectomies, maybe you shouldn't be a spine surgeon. If you don't enjoy taking out a meningioma, then you shouldn't be a tumor neurosurgeon. Um, and then the flip side of this is is the least interesting surgery that that exists in that subspecialty, something that still interests you. If that's true, then you've found your field. Uh, for me, most people consider shunts to be the least interesting surgery in neurosurgery, but I consider them to be incredibly valuable operations that we can provide for our patients. That's one of the reasons that I felt like I could tolerate the what some would consider to be the most painful in pediatric neurosurgery. And then once you've fully formed yourself as a human neurosurgeon, um, you need to find a job. So there are lots of opportunities for growth and career development, depending on where you go. And you need to look for those opportunities. Um, um, you know, my experience was that in pediatric neurosurgery, the field is small. The job, job opportunities are often few and far between. And I had a number that I considered, but what I looked for most in a job and what I encourage all people to look for eventually is the best opportunities to build your career and accomplish your goals. That sounds simple, um, but it's based on a lot of factors. And some of those include figuring out whether you want to be in academics or not. Do you want to teach? Do you want to do research? Or do you want to simply, not, not so simply, but come to work every day and operate? Um, and, is the primary thing you can do. Um, do you have the support of the chair who's hiring you, the hospital that's hiring you? you know, these, are the, these are the people who are going to make it possible for you to do what you do and you need to have their support. Um, this slide is in no particular order, but these are all considerations. You know, your, your future lifestyle, your finances, what part of the country or the world you want to settle in, location. And then lastly, Never forget to pursue your passion. Ultimately, your values will change over the years from the moment you apply to residency, just as I'm sure they've changed from the moment you apply to medical school. Um, you will find that as your life evolves, your interests will evolve. And you need to both chase your professional interests and cultivate the outside ones to avoid things like burnout. And one of the interesting things that I've found is that burnout is relatively rare in neurosurgery, considering the acuity and stress of our field. And I think that's because many of us have sort of self-selected as people who are just so passionate about what we do that we're less likely to burn out. You need to find your balance and that really runs after the, uh, the previous point. Um, you need to cultivate those interests outside of the hospital. And remember that within neurosurgery, it's not just one field. You know, we have six or seven or eight subspecialties. You can be an academic who has who does almost entirely research, who does entirely clinical, who does a mixture. You can be in a private practice that works in an academic institution. You can join a private practice that is that is just you, or in a group, or or employed by a hospital through contracts, employed by an HMO, working 
you can work locums where you travel all over the country working at different hospitals depending on the weekend um, you know these below the first three are not the ones you hear a lot about when you go and interview for residency everybody talks about academics but the important thing to remember is that more than 50 percent of the u.s workforce in neurosurgery is not in academics so there are a lot of things out there um, for you just um then to briefly tell you about where i came from i you know my my training is obviously all on the website but i went to dartmouth college i was a music major i spent my time doing my pre-medical coursework and majoring in music and played at the clarinet as much as i possibly could and then decided with certainty that i would never be a professional musician and um, decided to to definitively pursue medicine in medical school i bounced around among many specialties i started off interested in neurosurgery but i i spent a lot of time exploring others and ultimately found that the two things that i liked the most for pediatrics and neurosurgery. And I found that I could never walk away from neurosurgery every time I tried to. Um, I looked for other things that could stimulate me as much as this field could, and I just couldn't find it. And that's why I went into neurosurgery. It's probably the best advice I got from anyone was, if you could do anything other than neurosurgery, do it. And I actually got the same advice about music. <laughs> um, so I, chose pediatric neurosurgery from the beginning of residency, but then spent all of residency trying to convince myself that there might be something else that I liked um, to make sure that I thoroughly explored my options. Um, and I spent a lot of time in each of the subspecialties and came back around to this being the thing that I wanted to do. Um, and that comes back to my mentors. So making sure that you find the mentors who cultivate your interests and cultivate your growth. Um, and that really allowed me to pursue this field. And over the course of residency, I was able to also, in parallel, start a family, grow my family. Um, after residency, we traveled together to go do my fellowship. We came back here to New York. Um, and I work hard to maintain that balance. And I, I will not lie to you, it is challenging at times. You will all find that it is challenging at times, but you need to, you need to force it to happen if it's gonna happen. If you don't, if you don't try, nobody else will try for you. Um, with that, I will hand things off to Dr. Germano to speak to you about her experience, and then we can answer uh, questions as they come up. Well, thank you, Peter. This was uh, very nice, and uh, we are going to try not to repeat um, uh, the content of this um, uh, meeting. I'm sure that it will be a lot of questions at the end, but I think Peter really gave you a step-by-step -step, um, in-depth uh, understanding of the process that uh, one could choose to embrace and endorse uh, neurosurgery. And I think that um, for some uh, individuals like myself, I went into medical school because I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. So it's kind of pretty straightforward, but for the vast majority, I think that you need to really try and see what is your, your interest. And uh, then um, if you decide that neurosurgery is what you want to pursue, it, it's important to keep in mind that neurosurgery is a uh, relatively competitive field. And so uh, let's say you decide, you know, the day before you send in your application for residency that you want to apply to a neurosurgery residency, it's going to be extremely unlikely that you will um, be considered a serious uh, candidate unless you have a gazillion publications and grants um, because it really takes um, uh, some a building uh, prior to applying to neurosurgery. And this has always been true. I mean, even when I applied, uh, that was the case that uh, uh, the, the committees, the programs are looking for people that have shown passion for neurosurgery and they've shown that they have been involved uh, in the field. So I, I would just, since this um, is entitled My Life as a a neurosurgeon, I will, uh, if you don't mind, Peter, can I uh, grab the screen from you? Can you stop sharing and I will share? Let's see, yes, here it is, perfect. And um, uh, tell you a little bit about um, the aspects that I think are a part of my life as a neurosurgeon. Uh, you see that um, 
I think that there are uh, three, at least three or four pillars in, uh, in my um, career. One is my clinical interest. I have been um, always interested in uh, brain tumors and uh, um, uh, uh, that was uh, part of my uh, graduate thesis. I, I had uh, a graduate thesis <laughs> on um, immunohistochemistry of brain tumors. Uh, and then uh, um, I had a grant in brain tumors prior to my uh, applying to my residency. Uh, and I continued on throughout my career with uh, little um, side uh, roads to different aspects like this one that I'm showing you now, you know, the image guided um, computer assisted uh, surgery that also led me to spine, uh, not because I enjoy doing spine surgery, but just because the technology was also part of that field. And so that really built a bridge between two specialties that usually are very um, separate. Um, in the way of uh, fellowships, I um, wanted to do a, a fellowship in, in uh, brain tumors, but instead uh, my mentors uh, suggested that I did one in stereotactic. And so I went to Montreal Neurological Institute. And what that did for me is that I learned all about stereotactic, which is very important because now I do a lot of uh, radio surgery, but also put me in, in touch and training with uh, movement disorders. And so at one point, very early in my career at Sinai, we were only just a few faculty members. By default, I became the movement, movement disorder surgeon and I published, I was the first um, uh, U.S. neurosurgeon to, uh, to do a deep brain stimulator. Uh, and so that is also a nice little uh, sidetrack. That fellowship was also on epilepsy. Um, and that also, um, it's very complementary to uh, brain tumors and to really understand what is important uh, in the way of uh, um, epilepsy uh, surgery at the time of the um, of the tumor surgery, if any. Uh, and this is um, um, radio surgery that um, was part of the learning of that original fellowship. And it, it is um, something that I really uh, uh, devote myself and I really enjoy uh, doing. So as you can see, saying, quote unquote, I am a brain tumor surgeon doesn't necessarily mean that you're taking out brain tumors all day. And uh, um, there is much more that you can expand and build upon based on your interest. And you always have to keep an open mind for technology, new things that are coming on, um, and uh, be very flexible and very curious because the world is changing and you can't just enter you know, medical school thinking that you're doing something and continue to do it for the rest of your life. The other thing that has been an extremely strong part of my uh, neurosurgery life is research. As, as I already mentioned, I had a, a grant prior to entering um, residency and I continue to do uh, research. Um, this is the, the, the past uh, 10 or 15 years uh, worth of research that have been NIH funded, FDA funded, and multiple other uh, foundations where I looked into uh, stem cells. Um, I always uh, worked with uh, little animals uh, until a few years ago where I decided that now I prefer to work with cells, uh, with, uh, cells and, and clearly now the technology is uh, moving much faster and uh, we um, still might need um, little animals, but a lot of the experiments can be done uh, with a dif different technology. And uh, finally, I have uh, always had a very um, significant interest in organized neurosurgery. I um, was very much interested in the fact that there were so few women in the field. Uh, so we founded this small organization called Women in Neurosurgery that then became the AANS and CNS Joint Section on Women and uh, um, served as president uh, to that and also still actively involved. Um, I uh, really, as I told you, <laughs> I'm passionate about brain tumors. I've been involved with the uh, uh, brain tumor sections for many years and I will be um, the president in uh, 2022. I served for the American um, AANS and the board of directors, scientific committee, membership committee, and other committee, and same thing for the CNS on the um, executive committee and scientific uh, committee. And then uh, lately, um, I've been invo involved uh, with the world, and uh, that organization is called the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. This is a society that is relatively new, uh, was uh, funded in um, 1955. We really represent uh, uh, over 130 member societies, 30,000 neurosurgeons worldwide. And I've been the chair of the education and training committee for the past uh, three and a half years. Um, the mission is to educate and facilitate 
um, learning in uh, inter low and intermediate income countries. And uh, these are all the different things that um, I, with my committee, have been doing uh, in the way of education and training. And prior to COVID, this was the map. This could now look like a COVID map, but it wasn't a COVID map. This was all the courses on-site training that we had uh, completed right before COVID. And now um, what was in red and was supposed to be in person is doing is done all by, uh, by Zoom. But education has always been incredibly important and even more so educating um, or getting involved in, in the training of individuals that are in a less privileged area than we are, which doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go into the five continents, right? Because we work in Harlem, so just around the corner, there are high school students that we train every year um, in, in the labs and uh, to have them shadow with us. Um, and so uh, I think that if I had to do it all over again, I want to be a neurosurgeon. This is a little book that we just published. It's free of charge, so please go online and download it. Um, and the purpose of this book was to encourage um, minorities and underrepresented um, ethnicities that, um, you know, neurosurgery is for, for anyone who wants to endorse it, embrace it. Uh, we did hear that there is a, a changing in landscape in neurosurgery, which is true about anything and everything. There is a changing in landscape every year throughout the seasons, at least here in the East Coast, we have four seasons. There's a changing in landscape um, when uh, we grow older or smarter or, or whatever. And for neurosurgery also, you have to constantly reinvent yourself and be being able to uh, look at uh, what is there. And so if you look at this, right, what do you, what do you see? You see desert. So desert is usually not very appealing. What is it? A bunch of sand. Uh, but no, you can have fun with the sand. And you always have to think about the box and uh, out of the box and uh, be the leader and just see where that fun, what that experience can bring you to. So why not just uh, surfing on the sand? By the way, this is my daughter. So I have to give the credit to her. Um, I think that creating a uh, culture that is capable of innovation is what uh, um, my life as a neurosurgeon has been. And so I'll give you a few ingredients. This is not, you know, uh, how to make the sauce every night, but I think if you have these ingredients, you can combine them as you wish. So the first one is time. It takes an incredible number of hours. Uh, to be a neurosurgeon. And as Peter explained to you, you can choose. You don't necessarily enter the field to do it all. You know, some people prefer to limit to the clinical practice. Some people prefer to limit to the research or to other aspects, administration. But I think it's important to put time on the scale and say, you know, if I do neurosurgery, most likely to really have the greatest satisfaction, I have to invest time. The second one is energy. You really need to have a lot of energy to do this. If you're one of those um, people that um, wants to watch the five o'clock um, show, I don't know if there is a show, but let's suppose that there is one, but maybe neurosurgery is not for you. Um, uh, most people that are in neurosurgery have uh, tons of energy, not only because we want to do a lot of things, but also because we like to help our patients, our staff, and our students. Uh, resources, clearly, you know, money is always important. Um, I think that resources is not just money. It is guidance, it is advice, it is support, and it is help. And as Peter uh, mentioned already, very important to have mentors that you can trust, and they're not going to use you to accomplish their goals but people that really are donating their time and effort to you so that you can accomplish your goals. Persistence. Never, ever, ever give up. Even if they tell you that you cannot do it, you have to continue to do it if this is what you want to do. So uh, motivation, I say, I say that unless you put that foot on the gas and you're totally motivated um, to accomplish what you think is good for you or best for you, you're never um, going to be successful. And this is not the, the final one, but it is the most important one, passion. You need to follow your passion. So I would really discourage anyone who wants to enter neurosurgery for any other reason but passion. If you're not passionate about it, I think it's best to do something else. 
So what is my passion? I love the mountains. Um, right before COVID, um, on March 22nd, I had the schedule Kilimanjaro. I was hiking that with my other daughter, the one that's not in the picture. And uh, COVID came, but I've done a lot of uh, hiking. Um, I'm a skier. And uh, I think that everything that uh, has to do with the outdoors and the mountains, um, I'm really passionate about, almost as passionate as I am about neurosurgery. Uh, so if I had to do it all over again, I would do it because I can. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you, that was great. So I, with that, I think we'll open it up to questions, comments. Um, we have a bit of time. So yeah, just go ahead and use the hand raise function or if your microphone's not working, you can type into the QA box. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hello? Yeah, we yes, can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hi, sorry. This is, this is Ruben Vega for us. Uh, so I'm actually one of uh, your daughter's uh, classmates <laughs> here Excellent. at Sinai. Yay. Um, but I, I had a question uh, for Dr. Germano, and I think uh, for Dr. Morganson, this, this is a question that came up a while ago that you told me to bring it up again uh, in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, so because you've done a lot of work, Dr. Germano, in these areas and as the woman in this field, you, I'm sure you understand um, what it feels to be like the only person uh, who is not supposed to be there. Um, how do you navigate those difficult uh, circumstances or have they come up and how do you pick yourself back up and ignore it to to do what you want to do well you know <laughs> uh, again it's it's the strength the energy the passion and um, this is true not just about neurosurgery it's, it's true about many fields so right uh, you know I um, I have an MBA and um, I have a lot of um, friends that are in, in business and I can tell you that in business is the same so I, I don't think that there are uh, too many fields where uh, that is not the case um, but you're right uh, by and large in neurosurgery there are less um, uh, minorities and less diversity than in some of the other uh, specialties and and so I think that if you recognize that that is a fact um, you just do you just do your job and and you do it. I, I don't have a, a good solution for that besides continuing to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, and I won't say that I'm uniquely qualified to answer that question as the white guy on the panel, but um, I will say that it's, um, I think it's one of the more important things that we can do as a field over the next decade. You know, it's, it, it was uh, overlooked for too long. Um, the number of women in the field has been increasing now for a number of years, and I think the number of um, people of color in the field has been increasing over the last few years, but just not fast enough. And it's more than just about the perspective in the field, but it's also about serving underserved patient populations and having the, um, you know, while all of us, or many of us at least, I can't speak for everyone, but we're all sympathetic, caring individuals, but, you know, we need more diverse perspectives in our field. All right. Thank you for sharing that. All right, Umi, I see you have your hand up. No, how about Stephanie? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hi. Um... Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Germano, for, um, for, the, for this talk. Um, I have been I'm very, very passionate about neurosurgery. I um, was, don't have necessarily the best support family-wise, um, being a woman and coming from a very conservative uh, background in South America. Um, I am an international medical graduate. I'm uh, working on my fourth year right now. You know, virtual through COVID and everything, but I try to do as much as I can on my behalf to stand out um, in the country where I'm going to medical school. Every time I come back to the United States, I am, a, you know, a U.S. citizen. But I wanted to hear a little bit about, ask a little bit um, um, from both of your perspectives. Um, 
is there something that um, something something in international medical students, international medical graduates can do to stand out um, in specific, neurosurgery specifically is very competitive and um, but there's something else that can stand out I've uh, met a lot of doctors while working here as a, as a medical assistant and everyone so far has uh, <laughs> Then has a not have the most uh, the best comments to give me, you know, to say that it's very competitive and as an international medical student, you usually don't get a chance to to match in such a competitive type of uh, you know yeah. field. So I I'll just repeat the question because the the sound isn't isn't perfect, but I think the the upshot of your question is what as an inter international medical graduate, what are the things that you can do? to strengthen your opportunity or strengthen your um, profile to match in a U.S. residency. Um, it's always, that is, that is a question we get all the time. It's a great question. It's, it's challenging. You know, I, I'm not going to pretend that it's, that it's easy. Um, you know, you basically need to do all of the things that everyone from the U.S. does and more, <laughs> which can be frustrating. Um, one of the things that I think has been that I've seen has been really helpful, um, even though it can also be a little painful because it adds time, is pre-residency fellowships. Um, we have one at Sinai. There are a variety of other programs around the U.S. that do them, but it's almost, I, I don't, I, I hesitate to compare it to basically an extended sub-I um, because you get a lot more responsibility as a pre-residency fellow, but you basically um, you give yourself an opportunity to show that you're that you are um, a star in the U.S. system, so you get to work in a residency program, um, take call like the other residents, learn and train alongside them, and basically prove yourself. Because I, from our perspective in the U.S., it's hard enough for us to dissect the differences among the training that every medical student gets at the uh, you know, 150 U.S. medical schools, um, let alone understand the nuances of the differences in training that everyone gets around the world. And I think that is part of the hesitation when we all see international medical graduate um, applications. We know there are many wonderful international medical graduates and they're just challenging for us to pick them out. Um, so you have to help us. So there are publications on that. We publish one in, um, Journal of Neurosurgery Focus, uh, that was a March 2020, and the first author is our current chief resident, and you can look it up on Medline Search under my last name. And uh, there is another one that came out um, shortly thereafter by last author, Agi, A-G-H-I, first name Manish, and it, it really uh, shows the data on what it takes for a foreign medical graduate to statistically uh, to match. So one caveat about the pre-residency is that you have to be careful because there are a lot of predators out there. So there are a lot of people that use the foreign medical graduates. And by the way, I'm one of them. Uh, so I can, I can speak without, you know, offending anyone, but, um, th there are a lot of, um, you know, people out graduate, there, not a, not a predator. Uh, sorry, <laughs> not a predator, <laughs> foreign medical graduate. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not a predator, but I am a foreign medical graduate. So, so what I'm trying to say is that there are a lot of people out there that uh, advertise the uh, pre-residency, whatever you, but in reality, they, they basically use uh, the foreign medical graduates as, as uh, very cheap uh, labor. And whether or not that really um, uh, gives you a leg up remains to be to be said. Whereas statistically, what gives you a leg up is uh, the score and the boards. You you need to have really high scores for your application to be passed to the first level, which is that of having an interview. Uh, number of publications, quality of publications, and possibly uh, funded research. So those are the the parameters that statistically will give you a leg up. Unfortunately, we'll have to take the board score off of that list since that's going away. No that's way. right. That's right. All our knowledge, right, is going to be changed. So we go back to the sentence that it's constantly a, a change in landscape because what we learned yesterday is not longer the case tomorrow. So we have to, to really reinvent. And with one question, the public work um, is usually it's most beneficial if it's in the area of the correct? Can 
you get a little closer to your microphone? Sorry. Yes, I said, um, it's, when publishing, it's, it's best to do it in the, in the field that you're interested. So it would be most, most uh, beneficial to do it in neurosurgery, correct? Yes and no. So it depends on the quality of the publication uh, and the journal. Mm -hmm. So if, if the impact factor is the same, clearly it's best to have it in a neurosurgery journal. If you're uh, publishing a paper in Nature, it doesn't have to be you know, comparable <laughs> to neurosurgery. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Germano. You uh, want to take the opportunity to say thank you because you're definitely one of my inspirations. You know, being from a different country, from, you know, coming as an ING, being a woman in neurosurgery, and, you know, um, hopefully one day I'll get to meet you and work with you and, and uh, maybe I'll be running around Mount Sinai one day. <laughs> Thank you both. You're welcome. Um, we have another hand up. Um, I can't see your name for some reason, but you know who you are. Go ahead. Hi, I must have registered a little late. Uh, my name's Brantha Patel. I'm from the University of Virginia. Um, Thank you both for your time, firstly. Um, secondly, my question is for both of you. Um, I'm sure that along your career path, you um, had a lot of push and pull factors that brought you to academics uh, versus uh, possibly private practice. Would you mind discussing some of those that you might have experienced along the way? Yeah, so for me, it was pretty, yeah, pretty straightforward. Uh, I think that there are advantages uh, on both sides, and there is no straightforward answer. But again, we go into what is motivating you to spend all this time in the field. And for me, uh, what uh, there were two things that really drew me to the field, and one was um, the surgical part, but the other one was really advancing the field with research. And so for the... Um, private practice, um, that is not the case because um, uh, it, it is focused on the practice as opposed to a combination of the two. With that being said, um, it's interesting because at Mount Sinai, at least when I joined, we did have a private practice model and I'm still in that private practice model, whereby I really run a practice in, in, a, in a private uh, way in the way of, of uh, structure, at least some of it is. So, I think that it's kind of difficult to see, um, you know, which way you want to go. And I think that you have to keep an open mind and see during residency and also see the shifting in time in the way of reimbursements and things like that. Um, so there is no straightforward answer. It's more seeing what really uh, makes you interest what is your greatest interest in the field and if your greatest interest is either you know mostly research or either more um, building a practice and building a business then your answer is pretty straightforward it's either or and if it's somewhere in between there are also some people that start in academia and then continue on into practice which is um, a very nice um, you know way to have a taste of both for me, it was um, when I started out, I thought for sure that it was because of research. So I spent a lot of time in a wet lab as a resident and um, publishing papers, but quickly discovered that my main motivation for academics was education. Um, you don't get to teach residents in private practice. And that was something that I found to be incredibly fulfilling as I became a senior resident and a chief resident, and I wanted to continue doing it as a fellow and as an attending. Um, so that was the main driver for me. And then secondarily, um, there is not a lot of private back practice pediatrics. Um, most of pediatric neurosurgery is academic. Um, so that was just sort of a pull of my individual subspecialty interest as well. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Fabiola. I had a, a quick question. Um, thank you, Dr. Morgan Stern and Dr. Germano for, hold, um, for hosting this. Um, so my question has to do about, um, so have you, um, or could you speak a little bit uh, about some of the changes that you have seen in neurosurgery training over the years that perhaps have not only improved um, neurosurgery training and neurosurgery overall as a field, but also the culture, if any? Thank you. 
Sure. So I think that the change in hours has been uh, huge, right? So um, the fact that there is a limited number of hours per week uh, really makes the entire experience different because, as you know, you cannot be on uh, for more than 24 hours and you have to be off and, and so on and so forth. Um, and although, as um, Peter mentioned, uh, neurosurgery is still a specialty, a specialty that uh, is seeking to improve on uh, um, diversity, um, th there has been a, a more diverse uh, workforce. Uh, so for the past uh, uh, five years, um, the number of women resident um, in, that, in that neurosurgery has been 17%. Uh, um, of the, this is an average over five years, and you can find that in, the, in that paper that I referred to before, uh, as opposed to you know single digits in the years before. So um, those two, I think, are um, important thing. And then I think that overall, the entire world, uh, the entire culture, uh, industry, it doesn't matter if it's medicine, but uh, has changed, and there is more interest in um, issues and uh, um, personal um, things that uh, 10 years ago uh, were never even raised as, uh, as a barrier. Thank you very much. I also view, um, I think, changes in the model of education. I think for a long time, surgical residencies, including neurosurgical residencies, I mean, this is not from personal experience, it's mostly from an understanding of how training was in the past, but um, we're very um, apprenticeship based almost that kind of model where you know you learn that you learn primarily from the hands on experience of following your mentors. Um, and we have shifted more in the direction of actually thinking about um, structured education with the milestones um, with didactics for residents with you know organized recommended reading and things like that more in the realm of modern educational models, um, which I think helps to harness the time that we have, because with the limited work hours, we have to get better at teaching, um, or we won't be able to teach everything and learn everything that we need to learn in the time that we have. Um, so I think that that's been big, and also surgical, um, surgical simulation um, and cadaver labs have begun to play an even bigger role uh, in resident education. Thank you very much, Dr. Romano and Dr. Morgan Stern. Um, Kamal? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, um, so I'm a research fellow at Barron Logical Institute. Thank you, Dr. Germano and Dr. Morgenstern for sharing your story and your passion of neurosurgery. So my question is that how do you unwind after a long, tired day when you know that the surgery went pristine, but still the patient is not improving? How do you prepare for the next day? Uh, glass of wine. Um. <laughs> It's challenging. Um, I mean, I am, I've recently made the transition from being a resident and uh, so experiencing a complication as a resident is a night and day different from experiencing one as an attending. Um, you know, you look to the people around you who support you. I look to my family. I try to do things that, you know, to in the initial period to distract myself, but also take the time to process what happened and how you can be better in the future without dwelling. But it's it's not it's never easy. So I think you really need time uh, for yourself because um, unless you recoil, you cannot be um, a good surgeon, a good person, and each of us has their own ways um, that we like. I, I kind of agree that a glass of wine is one of my way. I like red wine. Um, I also um, really uh, am into yoga, and um, I need to exercise uh, to recoil. And ultimately, I have two cats, and um, I talk to them, and they talk to me. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, it's very important to know what you need. And, and it's very hard that somebody will come and tell you, this is what you need to recoil. But I think it is important to acknowledge that unless you do that, you're not gonna be as good the following day. Thank you so much. All right, Rachel. 
Hi, um, I, I'm a second year medical student at Rutgers and I just have a pretty basic question. I was wondering what a week in your life is kind of like, both in the hospital and out. It's a really good question. You want to take that one first? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I can answer. Uh, that is one of the one of the things that is to me is a challenge and it's also an opportunity because every week is kind of different. So uh, at least at our place, you know, we have days that we are assigned to do surgery or the days that I'm assigned to do neurosurgery or office hours or teaching or administrative work. But it, it's like on paper, but things are always happening uh, in a, either a rapid fire or a stupid rapid fire. So it's kind of hard to, to tell you, you know, I do this on Monday, I do this on Tuesday. I could tell you what is on my uh, printed schedule, but what is happening is above and beyond um, what, what is printed. But just trying to answer your question. Um, so I have two days of the week that I'm um, uh, assigned to uh, be in surgery. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm only operating those two days, uh, but it is my called my block time. So that is where I have scheduled cases uh, in those in those times. Um, I have two other days that I am quote unquote assigned to do radio surgery, and I have uh, a full day and a half day where I see patients, and then the rest of the time is for administrative work and or uh, research and or um, education. So I, I hope I. I gave you some sense of what the schedule in printing is, but if I had to show you that I, it, it is realistic, you would say this person is really a liar because that's not what she's doing. But, but there is, there is a, a scheme. Peter, you want to try to? Yeah, so my answer is at least somewhat similar. So I, I have about a day a week when I'm scheduled to operate, but probably three quarters of my cases don't go in that time. Um, because pediatrics is a very is an urgency heavy heavy field, so kids come in, they need surgery, and they go the next day or they go two days later. So that always shakes up the schedule. Um, I have scheduled time in the office seeing patients, half a day on Monday, a whole day on Tuesday, a whole day on Thursday, and two days a month on Friday, um, all at different locations because um, I travel around the city to be closer to different patient populations and see them. Um, and then the other time, I'm either assisting others with surgery or doing administrative work, which includes writing papers, um, starting up research projects, um, organizing educational things like this, for example, um, working on the resident education curriculum, you know, a variety of other administrative responsibilities. Um, and then you mentioned outside the hospital too. Um, so I take frequent, very frequent pediatric call. And so I need to be available for that. But um, fortunately for me, the calls are not so frequent as to completely just completely upend my life. So I try when um, to, on a regular basis, at least get home for dinner with my kids. And um, if it means I go back to the hospital later, that's fine. I do that. But I, I, I do my best to to make that happen so that I can spend time with them before they go to sleep. Um, and on the weekends, I do everything I can to stay out of the hospital unless a patient really needs me um, so that I can enjoy that time with my family. That's great. Thank you. And thank you for your time doing this. Hello? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you both for sharing your experiences and for hosting this. Um, it seems to me that it's more difficult to go into academics if you don't come from a very academic residency program. Is that true? And if so, if someone does go to a less academic residency program, what can they do to get themselves into academic neurosurgery? So I think your statement is uh, probably an accurate description. And um, I think that uh, what would make you a desirable uh, candidate is most likely to do a fellowship because during the fellowship, you can build that extra uh, academic uh, trait. 
and um, there are fellowships that are very um, difficult to get into and there are some other ones where there are usually uh, spots available so it really depends on the subspecialty that you're interested in um, so that would be my recommendation i agree i think um, fellowships are a big way to brought both broaden your horizons um, strengthen your skill set and make you more academically um, appealing to a program thank you I think we have time for one more. I see Luisa's hand is up. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Dr. Germano and Dr. Morgan for sharing your experiences. It's been extremely informative for all of us. Maybe this is a common and basic question, but this is something that I think down the road, many people will experience during their training. So being a neurosurgeon comes within with having an, an extremely busy lifestyle. So outside emergencies, what kind of suggestions or advices would you give us to prioritize what things should we focus on to be doing first? For example, if you are involved in academia or research or clinical practice, so how do you do balance out what things should be doing first? Thank you. Do them all. <laughs> the, the uh, I mean, I, I don't want to be glib about it, but um, I'm a big multitasker, and I think we both, we all are. Um, and you find that the things you have to do first are the things that have more immediate deadlines or are life threatening. <laughs> and so, a, a patient, obviously, the patient, the patients whose lives are threatened always come first. Um, then the grant deadline, <laughs> and then everything that's not emergent or urgent. Um, and you kind of try to juggle. That's yeah, so way. I think, yeah, I think that the patients always are first. So it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, if you have a deadline uh, in, in, in one hour, but if that patient needs you, that's really, at least for me, has always been my first and second and third priority. Uh, but then with that being said, uh, then everything else, you, you, you have to juggle it in. And, um, um, you know, nights are perfect times to work uh, because it's much quieter. So, and then there will be also times where, you know, things are not as crazy. So I don't want to give you the false impression that every single day is tumultuous. There are some days where things are um, at a, a usual uh, pace and there are even days where things are a bit slower than you thought that they would be. Uh, so I, I I think that would maybe exaggerated it. I, I hope that I didn't exaggerate it for you. I think that uh, what may be a little bit different than some of the other subspecialties is that it's a little unpredictable. So one piece of advice that I, um, I always give myself is that if I have a deadline um, for a grant or for whatever, uh, for uh, July 26, I put it in my book for July 21st, because I know inevitably that the last five days, I will have four or five emergency cases that I'm not gonna be able to do that. So, but there are a few tricks. And again, it's not just neurosurgery. I mean, if you're in business, it's gonna be, very much, I mean, high level business, right? It's going to be very much like this. You have to close a business and you're going to stay up all night. Same thing. Thank you. So there's actually one last question in the QA box that I think we should both answer and then we can call it a night. Um, so we uh, were asked about mentorship and role models. And the question is, who are a few role models that inspired us through our path into neurosurgery and how did they inspire us? So I'll leave that to you first ah, a tough um, so the 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 ideas really of have uh, mentors uh, came after uh, I, I trained <laughs> so, during training uh, it was more like you do this because I say so um, so <laughs> so those were my role model um, uh, with that said I think that um, I really appreciated um, my uh, fellowship, Professor Olivier at the uh, Neurological Institute in Montreal, because I saw even more passion that I thought I could ever see in an individual. And uh, he is a world-known uh, neurosurgeon and his specialty is surgery for epilepsy. So for me, again, the, 
the passion, because I'm very passionate about the field, I think that people that show me even more passion than I thought uh, I could ever see uh, were the people that inspired me. I have a, a long list, but I'm not gonna list them all. Um, what I'll say is the things, the, the qualities that inspired me and my mentors were things like meticulousness and care in surgery, expertise, so people who really sought to master the field, not just to show up, um, and um, humanity. Because you can do all of this and show zero care for the patient and only care about the perfection of the surgery that you do. And I don't think that really makes you a successful neurosurgeon. Um, and I had a number of incredibly strong, thoughtful, caring mentors in my career, both at Cornell for residency, um, at C in Seattle for fellowship, um, and also just outside of neurosurgery, you know, in my, in my time in music and in other areas of interest and, and study, you know, I had non-scientific professors and teachers who have um, inspired qualities in me that I value in neurosurgery. So don't just look at the people who are going to be your faculty in your residency program. Look everywhere in your life for the qualities that will make you better at, the, uh, at what you do. All right, well, thanks everyone for participating tonight. Um, on Monday, we'll pick back up with our neurosurgical curriculum. Um, so we'll be doing spine tumors uh, with Dr. Caridi and Dr. Steinberger. So I will see you all on Monday. Thank you again, Dr. Germano, for your time tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye-bye.